As I was leaving the parking lot of the movie theater, I punched up YouTube music and hit play on my Supermix playlist. And as luck would have it, the next song up was Don't Dream It's Over by Crowded House. There are layers of significance to that. For one, it's been one of my favorite songs for most of my life. For another, it's one of the few recognizable pop songs from the last 40 years that doesn't get a prominent needle drop in the movie I'd just finished watching. I kid, but the soundtrack is almost distractingly packed this time around, and for a movie in this particular series, that's saying something. And for another... Don't Dream It's Over has a lot in common with the movie I'd just finished watching before pressing play. That song and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 are both about the longing, reluctance, and pain that come along with one of life's most unfortunate and unavoidable experiences, the parting of the ways. I won't spoil anything for you in this review, but I will say that at certain points in the movie, goodbyes are said. How permanent they will end up being, given that these characters exist in a massive multimedia action-adventure franchise owned by an entertainment conglomerate in constant need of fresh content to push out to the masses, remains to be seen, but at least some of them feel permanent. And there I'm only speaking of the goodbyes that are said between characters. There are two additional partings of the ways in this film that may be the most wrenching of all, especially for fans like me, who have considered the Guardians series our favorite corner of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We in the audience are saying farewell to these characters, at least as they have existed up to this point, and so is the filmmaker who brought them to life, James Gunn. Of all the many sub-franchises within the MCU, the Guardians films have always felt the most personal. It's not difficult to imagine why Gunn would have been drawn to the Guardians or why he's been able to pour so much of himself into them. The Guardians are a chosen family of misfits and criminals who find in each other a shared purpose and a desire to be better people. And as he has told their stories, Gunn has experienced his own personal growth and evolution toward being a more mature, more compassionate, and thoughtful human being that can be traced through his work and, infamously, sometimes through his Twitter account. And just as the Guardians have followed their calling and found themselves the better for it, so has the filmmaker who pulled them out of the comics pages and introduced them to the world. From the beginning, Gunn has made them unapologetically his own films, cast his favorite actors, infused them with his distinctive combination of raunchy humor and deeply felt sincerity, and kept the series mostly independent of the rest of the Marvel franchise. The Guardians have crossed paths with heroes and villains from across their sprawling fictional universe, but mostly at the hands of other filmmakers in all-hands-on-deck crossover events like the last two Avengers movies. Gunn Gunn has always seemed far more interested in exploring his neighborhood of the MCU than in building connections to others. That's one reason why the Guardians films have always been among the standouts of the franchise. And I say this as someone who is a big fan of the MCU. I love these movies, and I love how interconnected they are. But James Gunn is smart enough to know that if you want to have crossovers that people will want to see, crossovers that will actually mean something, your most important job is to create properties that are unique and strong and compelling in their own right so you have things to cross over. Here's something else James Gunn realizes that some lesser filmmakers, including those who have also done quite a bit of work in the superhero genre, don't. Big, flashy, CGI-laden action sequences really only work when they feature characters we give a shit about. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 features one of those over-the-top cinematic splash panels that have become almost mandatory in films of this genre, where a team of heroes does battle with a small army of villains and the camera floats and flies and zips and slides through the scene, shifting in and out of slow motion with the soundtrack blasting one of its many instantly recognizable pop songs. 
It's the kind of scene that felt almost revolutionary 15 years ago. Now, this kind of thing has become commonplace and often boring. Gunn makes it work, though. And some of that is down to his skill and instincts as a visual storyteller, but a lot of it is this simple. We care about the people on the screen. We want them to win, and we don't want them to get hurt. A film like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 really only works if we are deeply emotionally invested in these characters. The Guardians aren't gods or figures of awe. This isn't superhero as power fantasy. This is superhero as empathy machine. This isn't a story about revenge. This is a story about mercy. Although there are plenty of characters who have done things worthy of revenge, including the big bad this time around, the high evolutionary, one of the best and most loathsome villains to turn up in an MCU movie in quite a while. And even though there are moments of profound sadness, this isn't a story about death or despair. This is a story about love and friendship and the redemption they make possible. At two and a half hours, it does sometimes feel like a bit too much of a good thing. The constant needle drops do get to be a bit much, but at least when Gunn does occasionally go a bit too far or indulge himself a bit too much, he's doing so not as an ascended nerd determined to cram in as much lore and gratuitous world building as he can, but as a storyteller, a writer who leads with his heart and puts his characters first always and a truly impressive visual stylist. The Guardian series has always been tied with the Black Panther films for the title of best-looking MCU movies, while Black Panther and its sequel use the real-life cultures of sub-Saharan Africa and Central America as inspiration for creating spectacular but mostly grounded, earthbound sci-fi fantasy settings. The Guardians films have given us pure Silver Age psychedelia. Thanks to the Guardians films, outer space in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is one of the most colorful places you can imagine, with bright and brilliant clouds of gas and irresistibly bizarre planets, outposts, and ships everywhere you look. There's a lot to this movie. And not just in terms of the runtime. Lots of characters, lots of little stories going on alongside the big one. But through it all, Despite letting a few set pieces go on a bit too long and sometimes failing to cut off the banter between his always funny and endearing central ensemble soon enough, Gunn never loses focus. This isn't a story where the fate of the universe hangs in the balance. The stakes here are far less cosmic and far more personal. Which is not to say the villain isn't a genocidal maniac, or that the Guardians aren't fighting to save millions of people, just that the story is driven by a relative handful of people, and what they will do for each other. There are setups and payoffs galore, including late payoffs to things you didn't even know were setups. I love those. Every major character has something meaningful to do, and every actor in the main ensemble gets multiple moments to shine. Series veterans Chris Pratt as Star-Lord, Bradley Cooper as Rocket, Dave Bautista as Drax, Zoe Saldana as Gamora, Karen Gillan as Nebula, Palm Clementif as Mantis, and Vin Diesel as Groot. Plus, series newcomers Will Poulter as Adam Warlock, Maria Bakalava as Cosmo, and Shakuri Iwuji as the High Evolutionary. And let's not forget stalwart supporting player Sean Gunn, who returns as Kraglin to remind us that, yeah, maybe he did get the job because his brother's the director, but he didn't just get the job because his brother's the director. There are big emotional beats all of which land just like they're supposed to because they are earned. There are more laughs than I can even remember. There are some outstanding action scenes. There are moments of heartache and moments of joy. Some endings are sad, some are happy, but they all satisfy because they all feel right. Running through everything, imparting meaning and resonance is the difficult truth that nothing lasts forever. When Juliet says goodnight to Romeo on the balcony, she tells him that parting is such sweet sorrow. And isn't that the truth? We say goodbye to people, to places, to times in our lives that have been special to us, and there is pain and it hurts, but it also reminds us of the love. It's true nothing lasts forever, but the fact that they don't last 
is what makes the good times so precious while they do. It's a good movie, is what I'm saying. Go see it. And, not that I have to tell you this, but stay to the end. There are mid- and post-credit scenes. True to the spirit of the film, they don't serve to set up future entries in the series or tease other upcoming projects in the ever-expanding MCU. There is a so-and-so will return title before the final fade to black, but what that means specifically is anybody's guess at this point. The mid- and post credit scenes merely confirm that a couple of things which we are told are going to happen in the main body of the film do, in fact, happen. They show us nothing all that new or unexpected or necessary. They exist, it seems, to allow us to take a few final parting glances at these characters as we've known them. It's almost as if Gunn himself couldn't bear to let them go quite yet. And if that is the case, I can hardly blame him. I know just how he feels.